Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today. The first thing I would like for you to do for me is raise your hand if you would like to die broke. Anybody? Well, some people say yes, some people say no, but the answer really isn't important. As a fourth generation Washingtonian, I know that everyone doesn't necessarily get the opportunity to make that choice. The real opportunity there is the fact that you're able to even make a choice. Most people don't get that. I'm gonna take you on a journey through how I built my company and tell you a story. And hopefully we'll learn a lot together along the way. I also kind of want to make it a little bit interactive. So if you have a burning question that you want to ask, go ahead and I'm more than happy to pause and kind of answer it for you. So I was raised in a life insurance sales family. I grew up traveling around the country with my mother and going to different government distribution centers and working with government employees and going into people's homes and all of these types of things. And it always boggled my mind why people didn't know how to manage their money. There was a particular lady named Ms. Chambers where my mother would have to go to her house every single month for like 20 years to help her manage her bills. And my mother did this for free just to help this lady. And there were a few other clients like that that I got to know along my life. And I always felt like, and she had like 10 kids. And I always felt like, okay, this entire family can't help this lady manage her bills. My mother has to come here like every month. And so that kind of instilled a passion in me to want to create some type of financial literacy solution. So as we fast forward, I go off to college and I'm majoring in marketing and I'm at Hampton University. And I walk in the library one day and a group of people come up to me and say, we want you to lead us in a Goldman Sachs portfolio challenge. And I say, I don't know anything about the stock market and I've never done a portfolio challenge. And they say, we're confident you can lead us. And I say, okay. <laughs> we were already in the library at the computers. They took me over and they showed me the stock market for the first time. Now, although I had just interned at FINRA, the Financial Regulatory Authority, and I was a co-author of the Member Regulation Handbook, I had still never actually seen the stock market myself. I had never been taught investment management or any, I had no clue about the stock market. So that day, I saw it and I started to review it for the first time. That day was December 8th, 2008. The stock market had just crashed. Goldman Sachs was frantic and they were trying to figure out what to do. So they created a competition to see what we might be able to come up with in terms of the stocks during, the, uh, during Christmas time. So from December, 2000, December 8th to January 9th, I had to study the stock market and actually come up with something. And during that time, I actually kind of reverse engineered or did a regression analysis on the stock market over the past 25 years. I then crossed that by different cr uh, crisis reactions, and then I crossed it by Christmas time. And I came up with an algorithm for the stock market. And we did positive 2% and the market did negative 2% at that exact time. And it was at that moment that I asked myself, how would anyone figure this out? There needs to be a game to allow people to live out their financial life without the risk of them losing their money. But not necessarily just stock, and not just life insurance, but everything. It needs to walk people from birth to retirement and let them simulate their financial life so that once they actually have the money, they're then able to know what to do with it because they've already kind of played that out in a game. So it was a complete theory of mine at the time. This was 2009. The only thing education technology was Blackboard. Gamification wasn't a word until 2012 when Wharton started writing papers on it. And financial literacy didn't become a requirement until 2014 when the government changed the Common Core Standards. So when I was screaming financial literacy education technology game, people were looking at me like, what are you smoking? Get, get away from us. I was laughed out of countless rooms with this idea, okay? So I kind of let it go for a moment, and I became a global market research analyst. I came up with a uh, marketing plan to sell life insurance to Generation Y. I won credentials, case competition, and I went off. 
While there, I conducted over 70 financial behavior studies, all with still having this idea in the back of my mind. I even took it to the chief marketing officer when I first got there and asked him what he thought about it. And in case I, I ever got the guts to leave, I would have it on record that I had this idea already. So as I conducted all of this research, I'm the author of the African American Financial Experience Study, the reason that blacks are now in life insurance commercials. I was able to prove that blacks actually own life insurance at an equal or higher value than other races. Uh, the Life Insurance Market Research Association duplicated my research study because it was so groundbreaking. And I also proved that the best way to educate blacks on finances is through churches. That was also groundbreaking. And if anybody is paying attention to the financial services industry, they are completely going after churches now as a result of my study. Exactly, I know, girl. And so, um, so moving from there, I then had the opportunity to make the company $6 billion in my last year, uh, figuring out problem resolution standards. And then I went off to Africa. Where else do you go after you do something like that, right? And the company had just given me a full ride to Wharton, a $30,000 bonus for my $6 billion, and uh, placed me on the CEO track. And while I was in Kenya, I met a little boy in a Wharton t-shirt. It was his only piece of clothing. Every day, I had to watch this little boy in this Wharton t-shirt while I knew I had a full ride to Wharton waiting for me back home. I had more money than I knew what to do with at the time. I was making $91,000 and I was 23. I had two cars, I had a Skyline apartment, and I was living off of just half of my income because I was saving the other half in case I ever quit to start my company. So I, I had everything that I wanted in life, but it bothered me to know that this little boy was over here in Kenya walking around in a Wharton t-shirt and no matter how smart he became, he probably would never have the opportunity to actually go to Wharton. At that same time, I found out that while people over in Africa didn't necessarily have uh, water and clothes, they had smartphones. Did you know that there's currently three billion people in poverty, but 1.5 billion of them have smartphones? So when I discovered that, I said it makes sense to put financial literacy on a smartphone. This is kind of a no-brainer at this point. Then I look around, I look around at my community, I look around at what youth are doing, I look around at what a lot of impoverished people are spending their time doing, and it occurs to me that the original idea that I had about a game is actually the solution for poverty. Like, it's act it actually could work. And so I start putting it together, I start formulating it, I start doing market research around it, I go and I meet with all the different heads of Prudential, and then they start to tell me it could make billions of dollars. And I say, oh really? I think this might be my exit. <laughs> so I did leave, I left. And I actually started a company directly under Bob Dorf, if anybody is familiar with the Startup Owner's Manual. And so it was a, it was a very fortunate position for me. But again, at the time, I was way ahead of the market. People didn't think that education was going to be profitable for a startup for you to invest in. And gaming still is kind of a subject that people don't completely all the way get. So I kind of had to build it along the way. But I learned a lot, and I want to share those things with you that I learned that I was able to, to build. I work with a lady named Dr. Tamara Clegg at the University of Maryland, and she specialized in participatory design. Raise your hand if you know what participatory design is. Okay, because I don't want to bore you if you already do. It was one of the best things that I ever learned in game design. When designing a technology product, especially a game, participatory design takes the influence of the end user in actually designing the game. So we actually brought on 15 students that were all game design majors from the Art Institute of Washington that knew nothing about finance and had them learn finance as they developed the game. Is everyone following me? And that in itself, I will give maybe 40% credit to why our game has done so well. I also had to have an open mind. Our game is similar to Candy Crush. 
But instead of swapping around candy, you swap around credit types to be able to pay off your debt, achieve a high credit score, and learn from the multiple choice questions. It's now named the best financial literacy product in the country by the White House, Department of Education, and J.P. Morgan Chase. We're also one of the top 10 apps in the world for the second year in a row with Google, number one in 14 countries on Apple, most downloaded ed tech app, and top, 40, uh, top five in 40 countries. But when I first built the game, <laughs> I wanted it to look like Tetris. And they kept going, Miss Rich, we studied that in uh, game school in our legacy class. Like, we cannot build a Tetris game. And I was like, what's wrong with Tetris? And so, and so we built it like that. You have to listen to your team. You, that is the, the jewel of participatory design. Because if it was up to me, I would have proceeded with Tetris. But I secretly went and tested the game in a train station, and it failed miserably. And so the next day, I said, OK, tell me about this whole Candy Crush fad. And so the idea behind the way that we build our games, especially when you're dealing with a subject like poverty, or you're trying to teach somebody something, I argue that you don't necessarily want to start off with creating a bunch of new mechanics. You want to try to take mechanics that are previously used in other games that are already understood and take legacy components and then transfer that knowledge. So what did we do? We reverse engineered the Fair Isaac Credit Reporting System. And then we applied game mechanics to, it, to each component that make up the credit reporting system. For instance, the so I'm sure everybody's familiar with Candy Crush and like Bejeweled and Match Three Games. And so you know the basic premise is you have three blocks or colored blocks and you kind of swap them around and you have to match them together in order to uh, make a component or you know make something splash or whatever your goal is. So with us, we have the five different credit types. They're colored in various different ways. We spent a lot of time even researching the colors, even the shades of yellow. I remember we spent one day on just yellow. And it was like, we, I said, we're going to figure this yellow out today. I refuse to spend another day on yellow. And so, and so, but we researched everything, down to the font size, the font type, everything, as to how it would appeal to the eye. And so in doing that, the various different pieces that you swap around represent the credit types. As you swap the different pieces, they represent bill payments. So you have to have a minimum of three of them consecutive to, consecutively together. That represents paying off three bills. Because we're teaching you as you do that, you can't just pay one bill and once and done. The point of your credit score is a reflection of your likelihood to pay your bills. So you need to pay them succinctly and keep going like that. So that is one of the intrinsic rewards that we have built within the game to, it, it almost manipulates your mind as you're playing it because you're just playing a game. You don't really realize what's happening. Another component that we added in is your debt meter. Each one, each of the um, credit types have a weighted debt associated with them. And we walk you through your entire lifespan. So. We have student loan debt, which is approximately about 40000 all the way up to your mortgage debt, which is approximately about 100000 So it's not just even debt across the board. We also force you to pay off certain debt by a certain age. You have to pay your student loans by 30. You have to pay your car note by 45. Um, you have to pay your medical bills by 60. You have to pay your mortgage by 100, and so forth, OK? We also have an APR meter built into the game. So that, that monitors your idleness. If you are just sitting there and you're not paying your bills, your interest will go up. Everybody following me? And so we have kids you know, that know what APR is. I actually did a study on this. I went around Howard University and asked like 30 people what APR stood for, and only one person could tell me. And so we now have kids that, can, that are playing the game that can tell you what APR is. I got a video from a lady yesterday with her daughter begging, I want to play Credit Stacker, OK? And so and then we also have the knowledge component. We're the only financial literacy product successfully tested with special needs. 
I've thoroughly tested this in various different schools. Financial literacy rates go up by 42% after 12 weeks. We also did it with the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking. They did it across 15,000 students with the Summer Youth Employment Program. Financial literacy rates went up by 25% after an hour. Students were also 85% more likely to want to graduate from high school. That's another component. It provides them with the power of hope. And if you get nothing else from what I'm saying, that, I believe, is, is the transformation that people have. We walk into classrooms and we walk into settings. We were fortunate to also be a part of the White House National STEM Tour. And we see kids and adults of all ages not have any desire for their financial future or even, uh, even think that it's possible. And then they play our game. And they learn these simple components that are able to actually change their life. And it's breathtaking to watch before your eyes. A few examples, I was in LA recently and I was walking through the mall and this lady stopped me and said, oh my God, I can't believe it's you. Oh my God, I have to tell you how you changed my life. I was like, what you talking about, girl? She was like, your game, I played it for a month and I increased my credit score by 26 points. Oh, it gets better. There's another gentleman that emailed me. He increased his credit score by 75 points after two weeks of playing and now a total of 100 points after six weeks of playing. And then I have one that takes the icing on the cake. This gentleman emailed me two days ago and told me he was able to increase his credit score up to 803 after playing the game for a month and went and got a loan for $150,000. And so it actually has real impact in real time. And if I'm to be honest, I didn't even expect that. I knew that we were going to increase knowledge and that we would improve financial behavior, but to increase people's credit scores in, in that finite of time, I think is amazing. In addition to that, what we also learned, we were originally set out on young black kids. That's, that's who we thought our target market was. Interestingly, we're now in 60 countries. We've won awards in terms of the best apps in the history of Colombia and Chile. It boggled our mind. We were like, why are we so popular in Latin America? We, we almost moved to Mexico for three months just to figure it out. I'm still thinking about moving to Mexico. And so what we found out was Latin American women are not allowed to manage their finances, a lot of them in Latin America. And therefore, these women, I have international comments. You can go on Google and, and Apple and read them yourself. We have international comments in different languages of these women telling us that they play our game at night in closets. And if it was not for our game, I'm almost getting chills telling you this. If it was not for our game, they wouldn't have any access to financial education. And that's powerful. Powerful. It, it blows my mind to know the impact that this simple game is having on the world. And now, fortunately, I was named the next Steve Jobs by Forbes magazine, as well as a global icon by the United Nations. And we are now building a financial literacy ecosystem for the world. And we're gonna leverage my games and the technology to connect the banks across the world with the various nonprofits like the Charter School Development Corporation and the universities. And we're working with uh, um, DC Housing right now. I'm the only financial literacy partner for 28 states across the country with HUD. We're also the only financial literacy partner with the Department of Health and Human Services where we are certified for returning citizens. We're the first and last stop for people going to jail. So instead of picking up trash, they send them to us to play our games. We teach them financial literacy and give them financial psychology coping skills and it reduces their recidivism. So we really can end poverty through games. Join me, <laughs> okay? And it's really not that difficult. It's just a matter of looking at a pain point, something you think you can solve, maybe looking at another game or something. We just reverse engineered Pokemon Go, watch out. And we're applying that to the stock market. And I'll end, you, I'll end with telling you about the next game that we're about to release. So Pokemon has the various different families and they have various different characters. We've taken that and, and compared it to the stock market 
So we've, de we've developed 150 characters that roll up to the stock market indexes. So you have different indexes like textile and minerals and metals and different things like that. So, and we're also connecting it with the credit game. So let's say within textile, you have your cotton character and then you also have water. They can now go into the credit bureau and have disputes with each other, okay? In addition to that, you can click on cotton and it leads you to Yahoo Finance and you can see how cotton, the stock, actually performed on the stock market that day. It gets better. How cotton on, performed on the stock market that day then influences the S&P power of how cotton is going to perform in the game during its disputes. So not only that, but if anybody is in finance, you also have to maintain a balanced portfolio according to the Henry Markowitz diversification portfolio theory. So you can't just have a bunch of cotton or a bunch of water because it's doing well. You have to maintain a balanced portfolio. So we're literally going to have six-year-olds all the way up to 80-year-olds monitoring the stock market on a daily basis to see how their characters are going to perform in the game. And if you can tell me that's not going to change the world, I don't know what is. So thank you for your time. Download Credit Stacker in 60, 60 countries and in 21 languages. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so great. So my first question is, you're being really rich. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, are, are you in marketing? Yes. So I'll come see you on, oh. uh, from First Book. My question is about- Oh, I love First Book. All right, so the distribu your distribution plan um, for low-income folks uh, in the U.S., what, what, are you, what are you doing there? Thank you so much for uh, teeing up that question. So we considered that a lot, and a lot of people want us to charge and subscription model and all of these various different things. Our game is actually free because it's most important to me to end poverty above everything else. And I figured uh, other things would take care of themselves, and they have. So what we did was we integrated two ways. We integrated ads into the game, but they're game ads. So they're just simply through Unity video ads, they're integrated in there. We have the YouTube business model where every five to 10 minutes an ad appears and we make six to $12 per 1,000 views. On average, people watch the, uh, the ads about 7.5 seconds, which is on par with YouTube. YouTube is about 7.65 seconds. And so um, that's pretty much how we're able to generate our money. In addition to that, I have sponsors. Um, for instance, MasterCard, where we went on tour with them. I'm a, a GMC brand ambassador, where we go around and promote credit stacker and financial literacy, and then that leads people to um, pay their card note uh, more on time. We're uh, in talks with uh, like a company called Acorns right now for lead generation. Um, we've done other things with the DC government federal credit union. That's another thing. F uh, prior, uh, t prior to using our game, the DC federal credit union was using another uh, financial literacy product. It was failing miserably. They weren't having results and bank accounts were always overdrawn. When they used our game to financially educate the students at the end of the summer, all of the bank accounts were not only still open, they were still positive, and another 500 bank accounts were open within a year. So we helped open up 1,300 bank accounts in a six-week period just by people playing our game. Um, and so that in itself is also very powerful and something that we plan to do for revenue. And then we get contracts, like DC Housing just contacted us. They really feel as though that um, our games and our program can help alleviate a lot of even crime um, throughout the city because crime really stems from a lack of finances. So if we get to the source of preparing people properly with financial literacy, we can reduce crime. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. but. Um, <laughs> But so that's what we have a lot of other sort of revenue streams. And do you have impact reported anywhere? Do you have any compilation of your impact? I love your questions. Yes, ma'am. Because I'm a researcher. We do a research report every single year. We actually discovered the wealth gap before the country did. Maxine Waters is accredited for it. But I actually came up with my report a week before. But I saw Maxine and she invited me to her office and we, you know, basically confirmed each other numbers. Obviously, she's a congressman, a congresswoman. <laughs> but 
I actually had that discovery first. And we did that through working with the Charter School Development Corporation and um, employing the games and the program and curriculum. We also have a curriculum that is 110 pages that goes from birth to retirement that has also been adopted by the Department of Education. So in doing that, we did a research study around it and we discovered a lot of things. So we do an impact report every single year. Yes. Final question. almost a three-part answer, but I'll make it quick. One, we we are looking to work with M-Pesa for those various different things. Secondly, that was a big question that we had when we first started in investors, but what we found was, similar to the Latin American women, the rest of the world wants to learn American finances. They are looking at it as a pre-immigration tool, and so it kind of helps prepare them before they come over here. And then thirdly, because they're not receiving any financial education in the other countries, they appreciate the basic financial education, and it provides them with at least a baseline to then go off and be able to learn other things in, in their particular um, subsets and countries. So that's what we found. We, we were actually amazed by that ourselves because we didn't know if that was going to be a hurdle or not, but it absolutely has not been. Um, Nigeria is number four on our list. We won a ward in Arjibon. I didn't even know that was a country. And so um, it has not been an issue. Yeah. Thank you so much, Angel. Thank you.